Thank you for sticking around to the end of the day. I apologize that I'm only coming out the end uh, of the whole uh, um, deliberation today. It's a challenge of uh, one sick child and two working parents, uh, so that's, that's my excuse. Um, what I'd like to talk about, actually I want to pick up on uh, uh, one of Roger's last points, right? So, so um, you talked about uh, you know, having, having a hammer, a policy where we have a hammer. Uh, it's not particularly differentiated, and that hammer is focused on terror. Uh, I have uh, essentially in terrorism in quotation marks, and partly because I feel like uh, we have a, a hammer looking for a target, but there's really no target here. We, 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 we assume or we imply that there's a target, and we can certainly uh, conjure up one in our minds, and I will uh, in this presentation, uh, but I think it's a much more amorphous, and I think you were getting at that in your, in your points, uh, and that poses some real policy challenges if we're using a hammer against something that we're not quite sure what it is. Uh, I'd like to proceed in, in four steps. Uh, first, I want to briefly discuss the cases motivating my analysis today. Uh, and these are cases that are primarily focused in North America, uh, Europe, uh, Russia, uh, Turkey. They're, they're, they're not Middle East cases. Uh, that's somewhat of an arbitrary focus. I'm focusing on these because they're the ones that tend to come into our news media the most, uh, and the ones that tend to capture uh, the immediate imagination of our government. Um, but certainly we could expand the, uh, the, the range of cases that I'm looking at here. Uh, the second, I'd like to take a look at responses uh, to Central Asian terrorism. Uh, and when I mean responses, these are really twofold. Uh, first, the US government's response under the current administration uh, and this idea of extreme vetting. Uh, but also second, Central Asian scholars' own responses. And, uh, here, I, it's both the, the scholarly community in Central Asia, but also the Western scholarly community. Uh, next, I'd like to question, in part three, the logic of these responses. So the logic, not only of what we academics have said, but also the logic of what the US government has said. Uh, and, and really try to question these responses in, in an in a empirical causal way, right? Uh, look, at, look at the logic of what's going on here, and can we have some degree of confidence in what is underlying uh, these responses? Ultimately, I would conclude no. Um, and then lastly, I want to just bracket a few findings. Uh, one, uh, some empirical findings about the logic of terror, what drives people towards terror, but also a normative a normative finding about U.S. foreign policy, um, a normative finding that relates to this question of extreme vetting. So just to motivate the discussion here, uh, I gotta escape out of here first, I think. went on the uh, job market as an academic, my advisor always told me to have transparency. Do you know the days of transparency? <laughs> you never had to worry about an update with transparency. <laughs> OK. Uh, so I, I, I've selected a few cases. These are not exhaustive by any stretch of the imagination, but they are illustrative of the cases that we've been paying attention to. Uh, so the, the most immediate one, uh, and one that I know some of you are from New York, is probably fresh in your mind, right? Uh, was the October attack uh, that ended up um, was killing was seven people, I think it was, uh, and, and injuring uh, actually eight people, I think, and then injuring several more. Uh, there was an attack in Stockholm in April uh, of 2017 uh, that killed four people. This was also a truck attack. Uh, there was another attack in St. Petersburg in April, which has received a little bit less attention. It's a little bit actually more murky. Uh, certainly my, my colleagues in Kyrgyzstan tell me that this is very murky. Um, uh, where an Uzbek from Kyrgyzstan, uh, a suicide bomber, killed uh, 15 and injured 64 people. Uh, there was an attack on New Year's Day uh, in a nightclub in Istanbul, uh, which led to 39 people. Dying. Uh, and we think, and again, this is a little bit murky as well, that there was an Uzbek among the terrorists who killed 
44 people in an attack in Istanbul uh, on the airport in 2016. Uh, and then, reaching way back, uh, there's a bit of a, a time lag here, but of course there was the uh, Boston Marathon bombing uh, uh, in April 2013. So these are rather prominent <laughs> cases of terror, either in North America, Europe, uh, and if you want to throw Russia and Turkey in Europe, we'll, 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 we'll consider that as well, right? Uh, that have captured the imagination. Um, and there's a few things that are striking about these attacks. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is with the exception of the Boston bombers, uh, these are all Uzbeks. Uh, maybe Uzbeks by way of Kyrgyzstan, but ethnic Uzbeks. Uh, and um, so, so that's, that, that's something to, I think, Flag. The other thing is that there's been a recent uptick, right, in the number of these attacks, which is uh, many, many people have remarked on. But there's also one other thing that I'd say is striking, and that's been both the U.S. government response to these attacks and what we academics have said. So first, uh, the U.S. government, and I challenge all of you to read the next quote uh, with a neutral tone. Um, Uh-oh, you lost. <laughs> I, I just tweet up here. I'll, I'll read it to you. Uh, so this is right after the attack uh, in, in um, uh, New York in, in October 2017. Uh, he said, I've just ordered Homeland, Homeland Security to step up our already extreme vetting program. Uh, this is Spinal Tap going to 11, right? It was, it was at 10, and now we're, now we're going to 11. Uh, being politically correct is fine, but not for this. Uh, and I'm being intentionally somewhat flippant here because I think most of us as academics uh, and as observers will hear this, and uh, if we are of the politically correct ilk uh, that Trump is citing, uh, our initial response is to dismiss, it, dismiss this out of hand. And I think that's actually incorrect. We should pay attention to this response, and we should, we should see what the logic is behind it, and if there's some kind of merit. I think that's our obligation as scholars to look at this, and I'm gonna do exactly that. Uh, so uh, there's, there's one, one response, and the other response, uh, has been the response of academics. Uh, and here I would break this down into two central hypotheses. The third is the one that I'd like to introduce today. Um, it's not necessarily incompatible with the first two. Uh, but the first one, this idea that, that uh, these Uzbeks, and in the case of Sarnayevs, these uh, Chechen, uh, um, uh, by way of Central Asia, terrorists, uh, radicalized abroad. Uh, so Erica has written convincingly about this, and she writes that uh, quote, patterns of radicalization for Uzbeks are somewhat similar to, the, to that of migrants from other countries, an inability to fit into the society where they live, and the inability to live the American dream. Uh, they are looking for ways to belong, and extremist narratives seem to be the most attractive, right? So they get to places, they don't fit in, and for whatever reason, right, uh, they, they get attracted to uh, extremist uh, narratives. Um, Marlene uh, has also uh, picked up this idea, and. Uh, she writes that Uzbek terrorism is a result of difficult integration processes in host countries. Now here I think in particular Marlene is probably thinking about the process by which uh, the, uh, Uzbeks have, have emigrated by way of Russia. Um, there's some idea uh, that some of this radicalization has happened in Russia. Uh, Noah Tucker's done a lot of work on this. Um, John Hedleshaw, uh, Alex's co-author, uh, has written, we can't assume that someone seven or eight years ago who left their country uh, that they left with an intention of joining a militant group, of launching an attack, right? So this idea that we could somehow extreme vet, all of these scholars are suggesting you're not going to detect this at the point of departure. Rather, rather these people are radicalizing abroad. So that, that's, the, that's the, first, um, the first set of hypotheses. Uh, there's another set of hypotheses, and curiously, these come primarily from Central Asian scholars, uh, in Central Asia or very closely linked to them, not from the Western, for lack of a better term, academy. Um, Ahuna, who's in the Uzbek analysis in Sweden, has written that Uzbeks are of their very own right very religious people, and so they gravitate into extremist mining circles abroad, and they become very easy to manipulate. So here you notice the causality is a little bit different. These people, these you know, terrorists, uh, Ahuna was telling us of his countrymen, have been more or less inclined towards radicalism in Central Asia, in Uzbekistan. Um, and Sadiq, who uh, spoke here, uh, the director of Radio for Europe, Radio Liberties, and Uzbek Service, uh, said that Uzbeks have a trademark on the black Islamist flag. They raised it in the 1991 Namagan uprising. Uh, and as Uzbeks, he's talking about himself, we must begin to ask what is wrong with us, 
So there's another group of scholars who have said that there is a problem in Uzbekistan. This is actually very similar to, I think, some of the stuff that you were talking about, Roger, right? That, that there is this Islamist extremism, and it's happening within the region, right? And we have to pay attention to that. Uh, so there, there's another group of hypotheses. Um, I'll return to the third one in a second, but I want to get to this idea of um, uh, the first hypothesis, I mean, sorry, the second hypothesis that I just discussed, and the follow-on, uh, which is, uh, if this is true, if Uzbeks are radicalizing in Uzbekistan, or Central Asia more broadly, um, how might we, we being the US government, vet for this, right? Uh, and uh, this is really empirically quite difficult. Right? There's, a, there's a bit of a kind of a tautological problem going on here. You know a militant only when they, you know a terrorist after they've committed a terrorist act, right? So it's hard to identify a terrorist before they become a terrorist. Um, and then, then if you're not identifying them uh, afterwards, if you're trying to identify them before, you're looking for proxies, right? You can't directly go up to someone and say, hey, are you a militant terrorist? I mean, I suppose you could, uh, but that would be a problematic research design. It would be even more problematic than some of the survey discussions that we were talking about earlier. Um, but you know, some people have tried to get at this question, and Pew uh, has uh, taken a crack at this, uh, and I'll be using their, their surveys uh, to discuss this um, question. Uh, they, they've, uh, they've got a really fascinating study of the world's Muslims, uh, religion, politics, and society from 2013. Uh, and uh, they, th this survey gets at questions of um, uh, how people perceive militancy. Is it moral? Is it right to engage in militant acts? Uh, so they ask a couple questions in these surveys that may help us empirically get at this question. Uh, now, um, I too share some of your concerns about survey uh, problems, right? So uh, there, there's questions with these few surveys about how they had access. Uh, whether or not people were sufficiently willing to answer sensitive questions about the actual research design. The biggest issue, which actually didn't come up in your question, right, is the, the relationship between a causal effect that we might find in the survey and actually teasing out a causal mechanism. Uh, so there's all kinds of issues. Uh, and just to step back, and when we're talking about uh, the work that Marlene and I are doing, uh, primarily what we're trying to do is leverage existing surveys and then do things like focus groups uh, field research structure interviews to get at some of the, the issues that emerge in the surveys. So we're going to follow up on these questions. Also, we're doing some experimental design stuff. So some of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about here, there will be a follow-up. And I'd actually really welcome some of your thoughts about how I could follow up in a non-survey fashion to get at some of these causal mechanisms. Um, okay, so let's get to the, uh, the, Pew, the Pew work here. Uh, the, the, the particular proxy that I'm going to be using uh, is this question uh, in the survey. Uh, some people think that suicide bombing and other forms of violence against civilian targets are justified in order to defend Islam from its enemies. So that's the kind of the, the prompt. Other people believe that no matter what the reason, this kind of violence is never justified. What do you think? Right? What do you think about this? Uh, and it's kind of striking what the responses are and the variation is uh, by country. Now, um, for, I think, fairly obvious reasons, uh, this question was not asked in Uzbekistan, so he wasn't allowed to run this question in Uzbekistan, but they did run it uh, in uh, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and Russia. Uh, and um, just out of curiosity, anybody want to make a bet about where, uh, uh, you know, as far as who, who would be, which, which population uh, would be most likely to say never justified? Suicide bombing is never justified. Well, by country, by country, right? Uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Yeah, you know what? Uh, you're right. You're right. Uh, that, that, so that, to me, came as a big surprise. Uh, this is uh, admittedly a little bit difficult to read. Uh, uh, this is uh, the, the responses uh, by country uh, in uh, three Central Asian countries and Russia as a point of comparison. Uh, and uh, absolutely. So Kazakhstan, even more so than Russia, Right, said that this is the people respond saying that this is never justified. I should step back for a second and say uh, these are uh, these are samples that have been subsetted to only respond to answered yes for their Muslim. So we're looking only at Muslims here, right? People who self-identify as Muslim. That's a important caveat that I didn't mention earlier. Um, and so uh, Kazakhstan, absolutely, uh, m the vast majority of people say never justified. Never just suicide, violence, 
suicide or violence against civilians is never justified in the defense of religion. Um, Kyrgyzstan, curiously, came out uh, at the bottom here, right? So there's, there's, there's uh, far more people, far, far fewer people are likely to say it's never justified. Tajikistan was uh, you know, next after, after Kyrgyzstan, and then Russia kind of parallels um, Kazakhstan. And, and again, I have to say, these are Muslim respondents in Russia, right? So the, these, are, these are specifically Muslim-only respondents. So what, I, what I've done here is, uh, and I promise you I'm not going to put up the coefficients. There's, there's no better way to, to, to uh, order logistic coefficients are terrible, right? You, you, you'll make your eyes bleed. Um, but uh, I, I, let me just say that when, we, when, when I ran the model, and, and there's a lot more work that needs to be done here, I threw in a whole bunch of stuff here that you would think might be uh, predictive of variation uh, at the country level um, for responses here. Uh, how frequently people go to mosque, uh, the perception of the West and Western culture, uh, with, it, with their education level, what their gender is, uh, whether or not they think uh, LGBT rights are, 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 are a good thing. Um, by the way, almost universally across the board, no one in Central Asia thinks that's a good thing. Um, uh, attitudes towards the veil, uh, um, uh, age variables, right? So all the, all the standard things that you would throw in there. Uh, and you know, as far as results, um, there, uh, the, not, not, none of this really came up as particularly significant. Uh, but I do want to draw your attention to a few things. Uh, so you'll notice I set up this discussion by saying what's been striking about the recent terror attacks has been that they have been predominantly committed by Uzbeks. Uh, within the Kyrgyz sample, remember this question was not asked in Uzbekistan, but within the Kyrgyz sample, uh, Pew was kind enough to share some of the uh, um, some, some of the not publicly available information. Uh, one of those questions allows me to kind of get at ethnicity. Uh, and what's curious here is that uh, Uzbeks disagree with Kyrgyz language respondents. Uzbeks are less likely to say that suicide bombing and violence is acceptable. Kyrgyz language respondents were a little bit more likely to say it's acceptable. Um, Russian language respondents were the least likely to say that this is accept acceptable. Um, so you know, one of the interesting things that at least comes out of the Kyrgyz survey, and we should, you know, again, with all the caveats uh, necessary here, um, is that the, the, you know, as far as support for violence, that is, not, that, that, that is not mirrored as far as who's actually committing the violence in these very small sample of the terrorist attacks. Um, so that's one thing. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't dwell too much on this, but the next thing, uh, this is what actually came up as most significant in the multivariate analysis. Um, this is uh, just a, a, a quick plot, a bivariate plot, um, taken from the multivariate, of support for suicide bombing by perceptions of ethnic conflict. Right? It gets a little bit confusing here, but let me, let me say that again. Support for suicide bombing and violence by perceptions of ethnic conflict. Uh, so for those people who say that conflict is not a problem, for those people in Kyrgyzstan who say conflict is not a problem, 84% say suicide bombing violence is never justified. Uh, in contrast, for those who say it's a big problem, only 62% say it's never justified. This comes out as significant not just in bivariate analysis, but also in the multivariate analysis. Uh, this is one of the few variables actually coming out as significant. Uh, there is a rich literature here on this topic. Uh, several scholars have demonstrated, for example, in the case of Palestine, uh, the Israel-Palestinian conflict, that those people who have directly experienced violence, these are the ones who are more likely to express support for violence. Uh, and it, 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 multiple scholars have found this in diverse settings, right? Uh, so it's not terribly surprising. Uh, um, and, and if you think about the Kyrgyz case, there have been multiple incidents of extreme violence that might be influencing perceptions here, right? We have most recently uh, the 2010 ethnic riots, but there's a lot of stuff that's going on that would make us pause and think about how this logic may be obtaining in the case of Kyrgyzstan. Uh, so that's that's the, uh, the, the the most significant uh, finding that's come out of the result. I'm coming to the end of my time here, but let me just spend one second, if I can, on some of the implications. So returning to that first uh, slide here. Um, so. What I'm suggesting here, and there's a lot more work that needs to be done, and I, I welcome your guidance here because I'm just beginning some of this uh, analysis, both quantitative and more field-based, uh, um, but there's a lot to suggest that it's this exposure to violent conflict that is 
really one of the biggest drivers of support. So what does this say for extreme betting? Um, uh, well, what I would say is we could empirically evaluate both the academics hypotheses and the Trump administration's hypothesis. Uh, and here we found evidence that there is indeed something we can bet for, right? We can bet for people's exposure to violence because this seems to be a strong predictor of whether or not someone will be supportive of terror, right? Uh, but I, I, would, I would say that this poses a normative issue, right? If you are vetting people and denying uh, entry to the U.S. based on whether or not they have people have been subject to extreme violence. You are saying to people, if you know, if you've been in, uh, uh, the victim of genocide, if you've been the victim, the victim of civil war, if you've been the victim of, of deadly ethnic riots, well, sorry, we know that this is a predictor of violence for a very few number of people, uh, and therefore you can't come into the United States. So there is some empirical support for the Trump administration's policy. I would conclude by saying, normatively, uh, this should give us some pause, right? And the last thing I would say is there isn't much empirical support for extreme betting based on the ascriptive characteristics that the Trump administration has laid out. Those don't seem to be strong predictors of violence. Thanks.